Hi, my name is Molly Eckleberry. I'm an author of four books and an illustrator. I hesitate to call myself an artist because I really just draw and I mainly draw animals because they have formed my life one way or the other. Um, the first book we're going to talk about is The Foxes of Kirby Hill. It's about uh, the animals and most importantly the foxes on this beautiful estate where I used to ride my horse every day. Here are some of the animals that I used to see regularly. Um, as you can see, they're quite varied. It was a spectacular, lovely place, both to ride and to learn. I learned all about foxes from a family of foxes that more or less accepted me because I was on a horse. As long as I stayed on the horse, they were perfectly happy uh, to have me around. They kind of um, mirror our families. Here are the parents bringing home the groceries. And here's mom serving dinner. And here are the children being obstreperous and racing around and tussling. And then they usually, even while we were standing there watching, they'd stagger off under the bushes and go sound asleep, just like a human babies. Here we have a, a drawing of mom teaching her cub how to hunt. When foxes are hunting small rodents and insects, they leap at them with their front paws like this, and it makes the frightened prey leap into the air, at which point they get caught and eaten. What was this particular uh, prey? This is a fox in the winter time, and this really is how they hunt in the winter time. They stand absolutely still, and you can see them tilt their head one way or the other to make sure they're getting all the sounds. And what they're listening for, believe it or not, is the movement of the little creatures underneath the snow. And once their fox radar has located it, they pounce on it, and then it, there again, you have dinner. Mm -hmm. Here are some tracks of some of the animals. Here are the fox tracks trotting along. That's a close-up of them. Here's the opossum tracks. See how they almost look like human hands? Very interesting. They're very clever with their hands. And the rabbit tracks, they're not so easy to see because they're usually going so fast. But we made them look a little calmer there. Um, very sadly, as I was reaching the end of this book for the children to show them, to share this beautiful place with them, I found out that the um, property had been sold to a developer, which kind of threw a stick in my bicycle spokes. Um, I didn't really know what to do, but I just got my act together and finished the book. And then I felt that I really hadn't finished it, so I did write an epilogue. And if you'll bear with me, I'll read you the epilogue. Um, Kirby Hill has been sold to a developer. It will soon be houses and roads. There will be no room for the animals and birds. There will be no more wild flowers. The wind will no longer sing through the tall pines. There will be no trees for the birds' nests. No fields for the foxes or the butterflies. Just houses and roads. Perhaps the ghosts of all who lived and loved and play there will meet on moonlight nights and tell tales of how it used to be back in the beginning. And I do say to parents of small children that I think the epilogue is a little strong and they might want to end the book where it, the normal ending, ending is back here, which is just the end of the circle, the cycle of the year. It goes through fall, winter, spring, summer, and we ended with summer coming again. But then the older children will get this story, which is unfortunately the way it happened. And that was the end. I just hoped that I could give children some idea of caring for our land and an awareness of how difficult it is to balance land conservation and land use, to not just take it for granted, in other words. And that's the end of that book. Molly, you also wrote your first memoirs. 
What? You also wrote the memoir, Vest Pocket Farm? Yes, I did. Um, this I think of as being just a fun book. Um, my children talked me into doing it because I used to regale them with stories of my um, successes and failures when I first started out to take care of a horse at home. And um, that was a lot of fun because I got to do everything twice, all the fun things in my life and to remember all the great things, my life so far that is. Um, I have enjoyed it and it um, apparently other people have too because I still get orders for it <laughs> every now and then. Um, and the third book was is Willa about a guide dog, retired guide dog that we adopted. She was injured when she was little and couldn't hold up for training so she was put up for adoption and so she decided that she wanted to write a book. This is how Willa looked on her way home from uh, the Guiding Eyes for the Blind in, in Yorktown. She was so exhausted by the time we got in the car that she fell asleep with her head in my lap. Uh, she wrote a book about all the different things that go into the guide dog's training. They have to learn um, to, to think for their person. Here's one waiting for the traffic light to change. And of course they can't read when it says walk, but they know the different sound that it makes when it's all right to walk. And actually these dogs are smart enough when the finished product is out and working so that if the person they're walking with hears the sound that the dog hears that says it's okay to walk and they step off the curb and someone turns in a car that dog will stop the person even though it's received the order to go forward they actually learn on special occasions to take over which is a, a huge leap um, they're wonderful dogs here she is taking taking this person down off the curb and um, down the subway stairs. That's got to be quite a sensation for a dog to listen to those roaring trains coming through the tunnel. And here we are at the ATM. I tried to get my bank to let me stand there and draw it, but they said no, that it was not in the securities laws. And here, here we have the dog waiting for the train to stop so he can take his his master in and um, here we are walking towards a bus and here we are carefully going up the stairs and the dog literally gently pulls the person everywhere they go it's a very strange sensation to walk with them because you have to trust them completely and you have to move forward otherwise it doesn't work and the um, stiff part of the harness here and here is angled so that the dog can actually show you to just bear right or bear left a little bit. It's uh, the whole, uh, it all works, but it's very complicated. Here we are on an airplane. I wasn't sure how to draw that because I didn't see how the dog would fit on the floor. And somebody said they always sit in the bulkhead seat which of course I should have thought of because there's plenty of room in the bulkhead seat. Here we are patiently waiting while, while our person eats his lunch in a restaurant and taking them to the mailbox and just plain going for a walk. Um, that's the only time they rest is when their their person is safely snuck in, snug in bed, in bed at night and this is another shot of them walking along, taking their person with them. They work very hard to match the dog and the person together. Um, certain personalities just don't work, same as with people not enjoying somebody's company. Uh, this has to be a perfect partnership. It involves trust, love, and a lot of patience on both sides. And this is how I met Willa up at Guiding Eyes for the Blind in Yorktown Heights, New York. Uh, she'd been in a crate for up to three months because she'd had a broken leg, then it had to be repaired surgically twice. So 
when they let her out of that cage, she raced around the room, banked off the walls. It was incredible. And I said, Willa, come here. And she came at 100 miles an hour and knocked me flat on my back on the floor. I didn't care at all. I thought she was absolutely adorable. And still is. And that's how she looks when she's sleeping. That's her favorite pose. Crosses her front paws, goes to sleep wherever she is. She had um, a somewhat ambivalent relationship with our cat. Uh, this was how she greeted my husband the first few minutes she was in the house. She saw him on the couch, jumped on the couch, and went right straight through the Wall Street Journal. He was quite startled. And uh, this, somewhere here we have another shot of... Oh, this is when she takes things of ours, which we think is to get attention, but also to make it a game. Because if she has your favorite hat, glove, scarf, whatever, and you want it back, you have to chase her. And she thinks that's just a riot. This is a, again shows you her ambivalent relationship with our cat, Nick. Uh, he didn't think this was funny at all, but she thought it was just wonderful. Fortunately for him, her Labrador jaws are just as soft as can be. I mean, she could carry a raw egg and not break it. So he never, it didn't ruffle anything but his dignity, but it certainly ruffled that. Um, she had a number of things to learn uh, when she came to live with us. One was to not stare at people while they eat. The other was to try not to drool while she's staring at people while they eat. She has no control over that. She goes for a walk every day with her new father. Here she is trying to tell him it's not raining that hard. Let's go. You've got an umbrella. I'm waterproof. And here she is with something else that she's taken. That looks like one of my dish towels. She does sleep on our bed, which is very bad training. And sometimes one or the other of us wakes up with no blankets at all because she sleeps right in the middle, which makes all the blankets cave in under her. Uh, but we don't seem to mind that much. She's, um, she just has a great attitude. Um, this is She gets a bone when she finally gives us back one of our things that she has stolen. We give her a biscuit. And... Uh, that makes the game very worthwhile. And in her words, she said, I am very happy. I have a job. I think I, I have love and I have biscuits. And uh, that's pretty much her theory in life. That's, She's a happy, happy person. That's wonderful. Could we meet her? What? Could we meet her? Yes. Oh, she sound asleep here. Willa, come. Get up. Put your head up over the table. Pretend I have a biscuit. No. What if I? Oh, she's coming over to you. She's right there. She's back. She's back to you. Oh, no. she's back to me. Well, I'm sorry you can't see more of her. Come here. There. So we can see your face. Just a little bit of it. There. Beautiful. <laughs> She loves people. She thinks having you here is wonderful. <coughs> She's waiting for her father to get dressed and take her out for her morning walk. She's a lovely dog. She, um, she just loves people. She has a love affair with a FedEx man. One day he was having so much fun playing with her that he left and then came back and said, I forgot to leave your package. <coughs> <coughs> Okay. Excuse me. Sure. And you have one more book, no? Yes, we have one more. Um, this is just kind of a fun book. It's a, a interactive mystery story for children about a real cat who lives in New Zealand, and he goes out at night, and he steals items of intimate apparel, socks underwear of any sort, lots of different things, and he brings them home. And he does all of this without anybody knowing that he's even out of the house. And the mystery is to figure out how this cat gets into other people's houses and how does he find his treasures. So he can he look into, can he open doors? He appears to be doing a very good job of that. Can he go in and out of windows? Apparently yes. 
can he look in soup pots for treasures or flower vases and more soup pots? Can he find things in the bread box? Look at that nasty little paw there, just pulling out that whole loaf of bread. That's where the children laugh. They think that's funny. Um, can he climb down bureaus and get into bureau drawers? Apparently, here he is coming out with what looks like a handkerchief. And maybe, maybe he could find a laundry basket. Wait a minute. That sounds like a good idea. Like, you can just see him thinking, laundry basket. That would have all kinds of treasures in it. <laughs> and that's basically the whole story. So the children, I've told them there are pages in the back. They can write their own ending. They can write their own theories about the story. And of course, he has, he has all the secrets, but he's not talking. <laughs> and here are some pictures of him in New Zealand looking quite interesting, quite haughty, <laughs> and obviously very smart. And that's, that's all four books. Molly, thank you so very much. Thank you. I have a great time doing it. It's fun. Especially when the children laugh in the right places. That's just a pure adrenaline rush. <laughs> Love it. I wish you'd seen more of Willa. Yeah. But she seems to be having her morning nap. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. <laughs>